Welcome to the Steady Anchor Podcast, a podcast on the Christian faith and practice, highlighting doctrine and discipleship in the local church. I'm your host, Luke, and welcome to our third episode. Yay! Thank you guys for joining us again. Today we're just going to go over uh, one of the main topics of our show, kind of continuing in this intro series, explaining who we are, uh, who I am, and what I want to accomplish through this podcast, the Steady Anchor Podcast. Uh, but first, just a couple introductory things. Uh, so some, some new updates for you guys. First off, we're on some new platforms. We've finally gotten our podcast on the Apple Podcast on iTunes. So uh, if you are a, a Apple product user, if you're one of those people who can afford those daggum Apple products, uh, <laughs> then, then we are on iTunes and, and Apple Podcast, whatever it's called now. We're on Spotify, we're now on Google Play, we're still on SoundCloud, posting videos on YouTube. You can find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, if you follow us and, and help us out, like share our content, it's a huge help. And, and we've already received a ton of really great support that I'm really thankful for. But uh, we're also in a new space right now. I've just moved back into my uh, my apartment for college for the school year and uh, going through some stuff right now, recording this on Wednesday evening between some uh, some training that I have to do for uh, what I'm doing for the fall. But right now, I just want to want to come through and, and thank some people real quick. First off, I want to thank Ethan from the Shield Wall podcast. Those of you who follow us on social media saw that uh, we just had this interview with the guys from Shield Wall podcast, and they're a they're a great program that highlights discipleship, male discipleship, really helping men to step into the place where God has called us and and uh, and just in general to step into our place in our families and our churches and in society. So I love what they do. I got the chance to talk to Ethan and um, and he did some magic and made it sound really good and interesting. And so just go and uh, go find Shield Wall Podcast. Go listen to that episode. We've shared it on our social media, and it was a really good episode. Um, so uh, thank a huge thank you to those guys on Shield Wall. Also, I want to say another big thank you to two people who helped with just putting this podcast together. First off, to Amanda Holden, who uh, graciously designed our logo, the Steady Anchor Podcast logo, with the the little blue and black scheme and the nautical theme. It's it's I love it. I'm so thankful for how it turned out, and I'm so happy to have that as our logo, something that looks pretty professional. It's far better than anything I could have done on my own. So a huge thanks to Amanda Holden. You can find her stuff on online specifically. Like I know Amanda Holden Designs on Instagram. Go give her a follow and, and buy some of her stuff if you like it. Also a big thanks to Nathan Drake who is the musician who played the music for our intro, uh, that song Rock of Ages. He's releasing another album. Um, so go go follow Nathan Drake at Reawaken Hymns uh, and, and definitely keep an eye out for that because I love the music he puts out. So getting to the topic at hand, today we're going to be talking about discipleship. Now, we, we've talked about discipleship a little bit before. We've talked about how and why discipleship is going to be one of the main focuses of this podcast. And, and there's reasoning behind that. And you may have some, some conceptions about what discipleship is. When I say discipleship, you may conjure up in your mind this image of like, it means, you know, discipleship is a class that you go to to become a member of a church where you kind of have to sit through their membership roles and, uh, or, or discipleship is this kind of, um, this kind of emotional relational thing where you sit down with someone for coffee and you talk through stuff and you can get discipled by them. So, so whatever your concept of discipleship may be, I want to go through that today and, and find the biblical basis for what we call discipleship and kind of hopefully explain to you why I think that discipleship is so vitally important for a healthy Christian life. So we'll be walking through a couple passages of scripture, just talking about this concept of discipleship, how we can do it well, and how that relates to our entire theme as a podcast. So first off, we'll be going through uh, probably the main passage that you hear people talk about in terms of discipleship, which is the Great Commission. So when Jesus had fulfilled, come to the end of his earthly ministry, he had lived these 33 years and uh, 
going around talking and teaching and healing and, and doing these miraculous things for three years. Then comes to Jerusalem where he is crucified when he is killed and betrayed and buried. And then three days later rises again miraculously and appears to his disciples, the people who he had walked with and taught for these three years and shows them and commissions them. And here's this, this iconic passage at the very end of Matthew. So reading here, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 in the English Standard Version, the ESV says this. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus, in his very last commission to his disciples, before uh, Acts picks up the story and it says that after he gave this great commission, that Jesus ascended into heaven from, uh, and the angels announced that, don't worry, he's going to come back. And we know through scripture, through what his disciples have passed down to us, that he is going to come back one day. And we're eagerly awaiting his return. But until then, we as his disciples, as his followers, as his, his students, as, his, as the people who, who follow after the life pattern and the teaching of Jesus Christ, we, his disciples, have this great commission. Just as Jesus brought these 12 men and, uh, and many others that are, were less involved throughout his earthly ministry and called them his disciples, uh, they're, they're famously called the 12 disciples, those who walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus, who were sent out specifically. Um, the 12 who, all but Judas, who remained on and, and carried on the mission of Christ after he ascended into heaven. And so we have here his final commands that, that we should go forth to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and to teach them to obey all the things that he had commanded his disciples. And so we see this pattern here and, and looking at the language here, looking at understanding the context of the original Greek, uh, it begins with go therefore. Now this go is a, is a present act of participle, meaning that it's an ongoing state of being. It's an ongoing action that the main focus of this is that as you go, as you are going, as you are walking, make disciples. That, that making is the highlight of this verse. The main verb, the central verb of this whole passage is make disciples. And that's the command that he gave to his own disciples that as he taught and lived with and lived and, and fellowshiped with and loved his disciples, so too must they go out and preach this message to bring people into fellowship, to teach them to obey, to, to be part of this community, to follow after the life that Christ has lived in the model that he gave us, and also to, to obey and to trust that he gave us truth, that he was who he says he was. He was truly the Son of God, and that through believing in him, through uh, his death on our behalf, we may be saved. And that through faith in him, we be included into the family of God. That as John 1, I think 13 says, that to those who believed in him, he gave the right to be called the children of God. And so the focus there, making disciples. That's our, our commission as Christians, to go out and as we are going, to make disciples. We do that in, another, in a number of ways, by baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That through this, this rite, this sacrament of baptism, we initiate them into the Christian community. That through baptism, we are making a public declaration that this person has been buried with Christ. That just as Christ died physically, this person has spiritually died with him. So that as Christ rose physically, this person has spiritually risen with him. It's a sign and a symbol of their new life in Christ. Their washing and sanctification by the Spirit. And it's also, I believe, because of my theological conviction that this is a means of grace. That Christ, through this act, is, is present with us. That when he says he is with us always to the end of the age, that, that through baptism in the covenant community of the church, he is truly with us. And we also see in scripture, or in this, in this passage here, that he tells them to teach them. Teach the disciples that you make. 
to observe all the commands that I have given to you. And so part of making disciples is actually teaching them. It's, it's passing down the teachings that Christ gave to his disciples. And it's explaining to them that uh, the things that they, that they learned, that the Holy Spirit revealed later on after Christ, the things that God taught to the disciples, the words that we have written throughout the rest of the New Testament, that we as disciples are to pass that on to the next generation, to build them up and teach them and train them the truth of the faith, to point them to the true God, the true triune, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal God, who is high in the heavens and yet close to each of us. We are supposed to teach this truth. And and to learn more about that, the, the importance of teaching, of knowledge, of doctrine, go back to our last episode. Episode two is all about why study theology. And we'll definitely be expanding on that more in the future, but if you want just a, a preliminary understanding of what we mean by this, by our position on that, you should go and watch that episode. Also, it says that as we teach them, what we're teaching them to do is not only this intellectual knowledge, but also to obey to observe all that I have commanded you, he tells them. So that part of our teaching, part of making disciples, is teaching these disciples to obey all that Jesus had commanded us to do. In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. You will keep my commandments. And this is not to say that uh, if you don't keep my commandments perfectly, then it's proof that you don't love me, that you're not really walking beside me, that you, that you aren't a true follower. Because we know through the scriptures that there is none of us who does not sin. Like uh, I think it's Ecclesiastes 7, uh, 1 Kings 6, 2 Chronicles 7. I, I can look up those references later. But also in 1 John where it says that if we say we have no sin, then we are a liar and the truth is not in us. We know that none of us is without sin. None of us is, is without failure. There are always times where we as Christians will fall short of this glorious calling that Christ has called us to. But we do have the promise that when we fail, when we fall, we have an advocate with the Father. And that's, that's what he continues. That In 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, capital H helper, referring to the spirit that he will give to his people, to his disciples, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither knows him or sees him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. So it's by the Spirit that we are uh, that we are allowed, that we're empowered to obey Christ. And though none of us are perfect in this life, it is a constant working upward. And it's been said by men like John MacArthur that it's not about perfection so much as it is about direction. That though we may fall and, and fail and stumble, we are always going forward, always moving forward, knowing that we are... We are justified, we are saved, we are made righteous before God, not by our own doing, not by our own merit or ability to keep the law. Paul writes that by, the, by keeping of the law, no one is justified. And he writes in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, that for grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, so that no man may boast. It's a gift. Through faith. By God's grace, we are saved, that through faith we have access to Christ, union with him, which counts us as justified, that we stand in his place as a righteous one before God, and also as a true son of God. Going back to, to John 1, those who believed in him, he gave the right to be called the children of God. And so let's, let's break this down a little bit more. So what does the process of discipleship really look like? What does it all entail? And so we see through this, obviously, that it entails some aspect of evangelism, some aspect of spreading the gospel as part of this great commission. Because it's impossible to make disciples if, you're not, if no one is coming to faith. That's the first and essential step of this, that making disciples necessitates, it requires evangelism actually going out and spreading this message of faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, actually going and telling people of the forgiveness they have through the Son of God. It requires us to go and to tell this message and to understand this message for ourselves. We cannot be a true disciple if we do not have a right understanding of the gospel. We cannot be a true follower of Christ without an understanding of what Christ came and did for us. 
And so we'll be expanding on that more in later episodes. But for now, we'll move on. I think the main aspect of discipleship is sanctification. Now, sanctification is a word coming from the Latin, and it really just means being made holy. That through sanctification, through being made holy, the Spirit continues to conform us to the image of Christ. And that looks like a couple different things. It's And again, we'll expand more upon this later, but just touching on a few things. Uh, firstly, I think that sanctification reflects uh, bearing the fruit of the Spirit and putting the deeds of the flesh to death. Now we see this concept in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25 say this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the, devi- the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Now this expands a bit on that on an aspect of obeying the commandments of Christ, of being taught to obey this and, uh, and allowed to by the Spirit, that through relationship with Jesus Christ, our desires have changed. If we are walking in step with the Spirit, we don't desire to do all the things of the flesh that like Paul writes about in Romans chapter 7 that he's, he's fighting against this, that, that he wants to do good, and yet his, his desires keep leading to do what is evil, and, and this ongoing struggle that's within him. Now, there's some controversy about how to interpret that, but, but I think it's fair to say that this is referring to the way that Christ has changed our desires, that through being born again, through being regenerated, he has given us a heart that beats with love for him. And that because of that, we desire to obey his commandments, that our obedience is fueled by a heart of love for the living God and a love for the things that he loves. And it manifests in two things. One, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for they are against the spirit. And we know that these works of the flesh, which it lists out here, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, rivalry, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Now that's a long list, and and that's a hard list. Like, you read that and you think, well... Some of that, like I've I've never done some of that. I've never I've never I'm not a drunkard. I'm not uh, I'm not prone to fits of anger. I've never done, committed sorcery, whatever that is, and I've never been to an orgy. That's that's disgusting. But but then also it's it's a conviction that the works of the flesh are not are not only these these evil things, but also just impurity in general. That just as Jesus explained in the Sermon on the Mount, that it's not just these big sins like murder and adultery that condemn us, but rather it's the condition of a heart that leads us to those things. That Jesus said, if you hate your brother, it's like you're committing murder against him. That if you look at a woman with lust, it's as if you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So that none of us are are innocent of these things. All of us have, have been guilty in so many ways. But these are the works of the flesh. And those of us who are, who are being sanctified, who are being renewed by the Spirit, must fight to put these deeds to the death. There's a great book by the Puritan John Owen called The Mortification of Sin. And we may do an episode on this later about the ways that we put sin to death, put to death and the powers by which we do that. Uh, but this process also means the opposite. On the flip side, not only must we put these deeds of the flesh to death and refuse to gratify them, 
but we might also produce good fruit, fruit in keeping with repentance, fruit, uh, fruit that reflects a growing relationship and a love for the things of God. These, these famous fruits of the Spirit that he lists out here, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that the Spirit produces in us. That while we were in the flesh, we produce the fruit of the flesh. But while we are in the Spirit, the Spirit will grow the fruit of the Spirit. And it's interesting to see the grammar there, that it's not the fruits of the Spirit are, but it's the fruit of the Spirit is. It's as if all of these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of them are wrapped up. That this as a whole is what the Spirit produces in us. That we can't just say, well, I, I'm, I have a lot of joy, but I'm not very faithful. Or I have a lot of self-control, but I'm never really gentle. Like, those are areas in which it's being revealed to us that the, Spirit, that the Spirit's not producing that in us. That through whatever sin we may be holding on to, through whatever, uh, through whatever lack of, of submission that we have to the Spirit, we're still gratifying the desires of the flesh. And so that's just an interesting point, I think, that it's, it's all united, it's all one, that the, the Spirit bears forth all these things to some measure. We also see, uh, we'll move to another verse, Romans 12, 1 through 2. We also see that sanctification, being conformed to Christ-likeness, means transformation. It means that we don't think in the ways that we used to think. We don't live in the ways that we used to live but rather that we give our lives in worship to the Lord, that we allow him through the Spirit, through the Word, through prayer, through the, the spiritual disciplines to transform us, that we trust the Spirit to give us a new mind and a new heart, and that we rely on him day by day to lead us to what is true and what is good in the eyes of God. So Romans 12 verses 1 through 2 say this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now we see here that uh, Paul urging the church in Rome as he switches over from kind of the doctrinal focus of the beginning chapters of Romans to the practical side of it, that in chapter 12, he urges them to present their bodies, their very lives, as acts of worship to God. That we would live in a way, as, as we are living sacrifices, that we would live in ways that are holy and acceptable to him. That we're not being conformed to this world, to its patterns, its desires, its thoughts, its worldview, but rather that we are being transformed by the renewal of our mind that the Spirit in us is giving us new eyes to see, that we're allowing him and trusting him to guide our steps and our thoughts and our affections so that we will be able to test what is good and true. We will be able to, dis to discern what is God's will for us, what is good in his eyes, what's acceptable to him, what is perfect in his eyes. I also think that uh, maintaining spiritual disciplines is vitally important to this aspect of discipleship. That through these various practices that we see modeled through us in Scripture, that uh, it, we're better equipped to do this, to actually become disciples, to faithfully serve our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, and to serve one another in the context of the church. And so let's read real quick from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1-7. through 7. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave to you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of the lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother, to, his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to holiness. And so Paul kind of alludes here to, uh, to the church in Thessalonica that they would continue on. He urges them. He says, brothers, we urge you, we ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus, 
that you would continue walking in the ways that we showed you, that you would continue in these practices that we gave to you, in the knowledge of the truth that we have given you, handed down to you from the Lord Jesus himself. And so there's a variety of spiritual disciplines in the Christian life that, that we have been given for blessing, for growth, for growth in holiness, growth in knowledge and love for our Lord, and growth of service for one another, and for so many other things. And so one of our first series, which we're probably going to start next week, is going to be walking through different spiritual disciplines, talking about what ways we can grow in our faith, understanding of our faith, love for the Lord, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so... Uh, so we'll be getting to that later, probably next week. We'll start that series on spiritual disciplines. But I also think that discipleship absolutely needs to be in the context of the local church. And what I mean by that is that we as Christians are not made, we're not even, we're, we are commanded not to try and live this out on our own. That according to scripture, according to the pattern and teaching of the New Testament, there's no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. There's no such thing as a faithful Christian who is completely separated from a local body of believers. That the pattern and the teaching that we have from Jesus Christ and his disciples is for us to live in community with one another, with fellow believers helping each other to live this out in discipleship. That we would mutually encourage one another, that as, um, that as the writer of the Hebrews says, that we would not forsake the gathering together of the believers. Rather, we're supposed to meet together, to worship together, to, to uplift one another, encourage one another, to propel one another closer towards our Lord. That is the pattern that we have set before us. That is the commands that we have passed down to us from the disciples and them from Christ himself. That we would live together in this community. That we would uplift one another, encourage one another, edify one another, and also hold one another accountable. We've been commanded as Christians to submit to our elders, to the authorities of the church, to, uh, to trust them, to care for our very souls as ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can't submit, you can't be led by a pastor or mentor or discipler if you're just trying to go on it by yourself. You can't faithfully fulfill what Jesus Christ has called you to without being involved as much as you can in your church. Now, some of you may be pushing back against that. Some of you may be seeing, I've been burnt out by the church. I don't need the church. The church doesn't do anything for me. I can do it all my own. And while you may have strong feelings about this, while you may have genuine questions and concerns, while you may be, have, have genuinely been hurt by someone in the church or the church itself as an institution, I would warn you and remind you that the church is the bride of Christ and that Christ is always referring to the people that he has bought with his blood, that he prays for, that he loves and is coming back to redeem as his church, his bride. And so I want you to be a part of that. I want you to be careful with dismissing the thing that Christ has called you to. Because as we've said already, discipleship is learning to obey the things that Christ has commanded us to. Not in some way that we would try and earn our righteousness. You will never be justified by your church attendance or your volunteering. But rather, if the Holy Spirit is renewing you and changing your heart and giving you new desires, if he is teaching you and transforming you and giving you the desires that you love what Christ loves, Christ loves his church. And I think it's a dangerous sign if you don't feel that same love. And if, and if you have been hurt, if you've experienced this difficulty, please reach out to me or to someone else in the Christian faith that is more mature, someone that you trust, and talk through these things. Because this is a serious issue, that the local church is God's gift to us, that we would love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, worship together. And just thinking about how valuable and how precious the preaching of the word and, and the the Lord's Supper and baptism, these things, these, these, these essential components of the church, that without worshiping together, without holding one another accountable, I don't see how you can faithfully fulfill the New Testament example of a disciple. And so that's my encouragement for you this week, is to really consider this, really think this through. Am I 
am I being a faithful disciple? Do I really care to be a faithful disciple? Because if you're not feeling those, those emotions, if you're not feeling the desire to grow closer to Christ, there may be something spiritually hindering you, something maybe a sin or a, a just a, a, a way of thinking, a worldview that's, that's contrary to what Christ has called you to. And so I, I invite you also to join us as we continue studying these things, to be prayerfully considering what we've said. If you have any, if you have any objections, if you have any questions or concerns, then please reach out. I would, I would love to talk to you through these things. I genuinely would. And I'll get back to you as soon as I can, okay? So as we close today, I'd like to invite you to also go and, and find us on social media. Like and share our content. Subscribe wherever you can. It really helps us to be able to reach more people when you follow us, when you like, when you share. Uh, also, we're now on, on stuff like iTunes where you can rate and review us. And so if, if you want to go and just take a minute of your time, 30 seconds maybe, and just give us a review, an honest review, and tell us what you think, what you are encouraged by, and, and, and just give a, a little plug as to why you may like or why you may benefit from this podcast, we would really appreciate it because that does really help me get, uh, get out to people because we want to be able to reach people with this. We want not just fame but visibility so that uh, if, God is, if God is using me to help you, that I want to also be able to help others because that is the focus of this. The focus is to help equip you, the believer, to better serve your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And also if you're not a believer, to maybe encourage you to think through these things and hopefully to help you understand the Christian faith and who this man named Jesus Christ is and help him understand his message to you. And so until, until next time, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Steady Anchor Pod. Uh, you can listen to us now on Apple Podcast, iTunes, whatever it's called, uh, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, and so un until next time, love God, love the church, and love your neighbor as yourself. God bless. We'll see you next week.